Jephthah Homer Wade was one of the most important, influential, and wealthy industrialists in the United States in the second half of the 19th century. A native of Romulus in the state of New York, Wade played an important role in the expansion of the telegraph system across the United States, ultimately becoming a co-founder of Western Union. But he was also involved in banking, the steel industry, and railroads, as well as being a philanthropist and a very important benefactor of the city of Cleveland, Ohio, where he settled in 1856. Before all that, however, he was an artist. Wade spent the first decade or so of his working life as a travelling portrait painter. There were many such artists in the northeastern United States in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Their portraits, classified today as folk art, were painted for clients who wanted likenesses of themselves and family members, and pictorial commemorations of events such as births and deaths. Two of Wade's paintings survive today in the collection of Cleveland Museum of Art, an institution of which his grandson, Jephthah Wade II, was a founder in 1913. They are paired portraits of a married couple, possibly from Farmington, New York, Sally Avery Olds and her husband, Nathaniel Olds. Wade painted them in the summer of 1837 for a fee of $18 for the two. We know very little about this couple. It seems that Nathaniel predeceased his wife, who subsequently settled in Madison, Wisconsin, and the portraits remained in Sally's family before being acquired by the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. The Society donated them to Cleveland Museum of Art in 1991. Although painted in a simple folk art style, with simplified and flattened forms, these are imposing and dignified likenesses, finished to a high standard, clearly looking to the tradition of academic portraiture. They were painted for people who knew how a portrait should look. Nathaniel's portrait in particular also demonstrates the way in which itinerant folk painters were in touch with wider artistic developments and reflected contemporary taste in their work. This is definitely a portrait in the Romantic rather than the neoclassical tradition. The two portraits make a coherent pair with their similar colour schemes and compositions and the complementary postures of the sitters. Yet since they became part of the Cleveland Museum's collection, it is Nathaniel's portrait that has attracted most attention. It is not hard to see why. Sally is dressed up for her portrait, wearing velvet and silk, bows and elaborate lacework. But Nathaniel is wearing spectacles. It is these spectacles that attract people's attention, and that have made this portrait one of the Cleveland Museum of Art's most popular exhibits and created waves on social media, which have made this picture into itself a spectacle. But in any case, the combination of the steampunk glasses with the dark costume, sharply cut white collar, somber expression, spooky eyes and romantically tousled hair is irresistible. This painting, notes the museum website, has a distinguished history inspiring Halloween costumes in the Cleveland area. So what's the story with these glasses? Why was Nathaniel painted wearing them, and what are they? As to the first question, the glasses are green-tinted, which was fashionable at the time, but which also had a therapeutic purpose. Possibly Nathaniel had weak or sensitive eyes but he would also have been painted wearing these glasses because he wanted to be. As well as dressing with care for their portraits, sitters often chose to be depicted with objects they were proud of and that meant something to them, things they had a connection with, which symbolised an accomplishment, a profession or trade, something significant about their lives. Fourteen-year-old Abigail Rose was painted with her music, her books, and a favourite trinket. The medical man, Dr Cornelius Allerton, was painted with a medical textbook and with his horse, which he would have ridden to attend his patients. This whaling captain was depicted holding his telescope, a symbol of his profession, and with his ship in the background, 
engaged in her bloody trade. The land surveyor Henry W. Houston poses with a surveying instrument. Martha holds her accordion. Another Martha draws attention to a highly decorated chair, which must have been one of her prized possessions. Being painted with these things gave a richer and fuller significance to the pictorial evocation of your life, your presence, your personality. Spectacles were a very personal item, and people were often painted wearing or holding them. They conveyed something of the sitter's personality and biography. They could also be fashionable, even luxury items, possessing a certain status. Visually, with their delicate, bright metal frames and their gleaming, sometimes coloured, lenses, they provided a pleasant contrast to the somberness of contemporary garments. This unknown woman from around 1840 is wearing a fine pair of delicate ladies' spectacles that complement her air of refinement and poise. Here is Rubens Peel, painted by his brother Rembrandt Peel in 1801, with two pairs of glasses, one on his face, the other in his left hand. For this lady, from about 1838, her spectacles are clearly part of the image she wants to present of self-confidence, agency, and intellectual status. They are painted prominently, presented on a par with her other jewellery. This is spectacles as a spectacle, which is surely true of Nathaniel Old's portrait as well. So much for our first question, why Nathaniel Olds was painted wearing these spectacles. But what of the second question? What precisely are they? Let's focus in on these spectacles. The frame is metal, probably steel or silver. It may well have been more delicate in construction than is indicated here by the painter, who has used broad brush strokes to build up the form. This is one of the things that gives these spectacles, for us, a modernistic look, which is appealing to our eyes, but probably not true to their original appearance. The supports on either side extend, of course, over and behind the ears, with most of their length concealed by Nathaniel's hair, and they are hinged at the front. The glasses have four green-tinted lenses, two at the front and two at the sides. The lenses are D-shaped, and their flat sides are connected by a hinge, which enables the side pieces to lie flat against the front lenses, or to be extended to the sides. This style of spectacles with hinged side pieces was invented by the British optician James Ayscough in the 1750s, and by the early 19th century it had become a popular and widely available style, worn sometimes for health reasons and sometimes as a matter of choice. The side pieces provided extra protection from light as well as from dust and foreign bodies. They were supposedly favoured by coachmen, and subsequently by early railway passengers for that reason, which is why you may sometimes see them described as coach or railway glasses, although these terms are modern rather than contemporary. This set, with blue lenses, possibly of French manufacture, is in the collection of the Science Museum in London. Blue glass was recommended by many opticians in preference to green, as it was believed to be truer to original colours and better for the eyesight. These spectacles from the Smithsonian strongly resemble the ones worn by Nathaniel Olds, with the same design of hinge and a simple arched bridge, but with lenses tinted two different shades, blue at the front and bluish-green at the sides. The gentleman in this Spanish portrait of 1839 wears a set of spectacles of the same basic design, although in this case the front lenses are clear and the side lenses are tinted, enabling the wearer to switch between darkened and clear lenses at will. Coloured lenses in spectacles were the subject of some controversy in the 19th century. They were very popular and fashionable, but were seen by some as an irritating affectation, while eye specialists often warned against them, except when required for medical reasons. In his book Eyesight, Good and Bad in 1880, the British surgeon Robert Brudenell Carter wrote that spectacles with coloured glasses are especially to be avoided except under surgical advice. 
they are never otherwise than injurious to perfectly healthy eyes, and also recommended blue rather than green lenses. Carter went on specifically to recommend glasses with side lenses. Frames, having side pieces furnished with glasses, afford a ready means of completely protecting the eyes laterally. The type of glasses worn by Olds thus came with medical approval, although we will never know whether he is wearing them for medical reasons or as a fashion statement, or because he wants to live in a permanent state of artificial twilight, like a character from Edgar Allan Poe. Poe's green spectacle wearers include his detective Auguste Dupin and the devil, who in his short story Bonbon wears a pair of green spectacles with side glasses, rather like Nathaniel Old's pair, perhaps. Leaving the devil aside, we can only speculate about why Nathaniel Olds wore his spectacles and chose to be painted wearing them. There is, though, no doubt about their determining function. They are a form of eye protection. In the discussion of this portrait published on the Cleveland Museum of Art website, a particular explanation is advanced for the purpose of glasses like these. The green-tinted spectacles worn by Olds were designed to protect the eyes from the intensity of Argand lamps, a type of indoor light used during the early 1800s. These lamps burned whale oil, and many people worried that its bright flames might damage eyesight. This is incorrect. The glasses worn by Nathaniel Olds in this portrait were not designed in response to the glare of the Argand lamp. As we have already seen, this was a well-established style of spectacles, originating in the 1750s, that provided eye protection suitable for many different circumstances. The CMA's rather categorical statement about the Argand lamp is really not supported by the evidence, and seems to be mainly based on supposition. I think it is a case of CPT, Curator's Pet Theory, a common phenomenon in the museum and art gallery world, which I might make a video about sometime. But what is an Argand lamp anyway? Argand oil-burning lamps, named after their Swiss inventor Ami Argand, were invented in the 1780s. A very early example can be seen in this 1783 portrait by David of the physician Dr. Alphonse Leroy. They consumed whale oil and used a new design of burner and a glass chimney to improve airflow, creating a very bright, steady and clean burning flame. Argand lamps were very popular and were in widespread use in both Europe and North America in the first half of the 19th century. They were much brighter than any previous form of artificial illumination, about ten times brighter than a good wax candle. These two paintings by the German artist George Friedrich Kersting show Argand lamps being used to illuminate sewing and reading, two activities that were made much easier by the Argand's bright, non-flickering light. The Argand was the best form of interior lighting available until the appearance of the kerosene lamp in the 1850s. Argand lamps were used for lighting shops and public buildings, as well as in homes, transformed the illumination of theatres, and were widely used in lighthouses. The brightness of the light, too bright for anyone to look directly at the flame, did mean that people needed to take precautions. Count Rumford, a British scientist and inventor who developed improvements to the lamp, commented in 1813 that as the light of an Argand lamp is so exceedingly vivid, when it is near at hand, it may often be found to be too powerful to be agreeable. The problem was easily solved, however, by glass, fabric or paper shades. In the essay I've just quoted from, for example, Rumford suggests attaching a simple strip of paper to the lower part of the lamp, softening the light sufficiently without sacrificing its steady illumination. What was not suggested was the use of special green-tinted spectacles. Nowhere in any of the many references to the Argand lamp in the literature of the first half of the 19th century in Europe or America is there any evidence to back up the oddly specific theory that there is a direct link between spectacles of the kind Nathaniel Olds is wearing and the Argand lamp. 
this seems to be a supposition that has gained a life of its own. It is neat, it is interesting, it is appealing, it reads well on artwork labels and websites and the kinds of content that museum curators have to produce to satisfy the desire of the public for such explanations. In short, it is a classic case of curator's pet theory. We all love this painting, and we all love Nathaniel Old's spectacles, but there is nothing weird or bizarre about them, and nor are they highly specialised, arcane, or esoteric. They are an entirely normal set of double-glass spectacles with a fashionable green tint. We saw other examples of the same design earlier in the video. They would certainly provide protection from the brightness of an Argand lamp, if worn indoors, and Nathaniel does seem to like wearing his glasses indoors, just as they would protect the eyes from brightness from all kinds of things. But to suggest that the Argand lamp specifically is the reason why they were designed is incorrect. Nathaniel Old's spectacles seem bizarre and weird, but also very appealing to us, for reasons that are entirely of our own time, and have nothing to do with why they were made and worn. The Argand lamp explanation for them is wrong. It is a misreading of their purpose, their context, and of the nature of this particular representation of them. It is an ahistorical decontextualization of this artifact, a viewing of the past through the spectacles of the present. <laughs>